The DVX200 has a lot of user buttons that you can use that are reprogrammable buttons that you assign what function you want to have happen when that button is pressed. Now there are eight physical buttons. You've got four here, three on the back of the camera, and one up here by the zoom rocker. And then you have four virtual buttons, which when you touch the LCD, they come up on the left side. Now having 12 user buttons gives you obviously a lot of ability to program and customize the camera. What can you program these user buttons to do? There are about 39 different functions that you can choose from. A tremendous amount of customizability here. Let's show you what they do and how you get at them. First off, go into the user SW menu, user switch, and you'll see that there's a listing for user one through 12 and what the functions are that they can have. So when you press the user button, it'll bring up a page of options here that you can assign to that user button. And if you look up in the corner here, it'll tell you that there's actually five pages. We're on one of the pages out of five that you can choose from. So there's a ton of functions. How do we figure out which ones we wanna use? Well, first off, there's a whole group of user button functions that are really uh, duplicates of what you can already do in the menus. For example, uh, dynamic range stretching. You can assign that in the scene file menu to on or off, or you can assign it to a user button and enable it with the on and off button. There's about a dozen of these that are really just duplicates of the menu system. So as you're looking at these functions, just know that you can either program these to a user button or you can get at them in the menus. Now, some of these functions are pre-assigned to some of the pre-labeled user buttons. For example, OIS. You can assign OIS to a user button and you'll see that on button five, it's already assigned to OIS. Button six is already assigned to zebras. Button seven is already assigned to WFM. Well, you could assign button one to WFM and have it on both button one and button seven, but why would you do that? That's just kind of wasting user button. And why would you move it off of seven where it's already pre-programmed and labeled right there on the camera it says wfm why would you move it over there i i don't understand so i tend to leave buttons five six and seven alone because i always want access to the waveform monitor the optical image stabilization and the zebras but buttons one through four button eight and the soft buttons boy those are free game for reprogramming So let's talk about a, a few of the functions that you get not through the menus. For example, there's backlight and spotlight. Now these are simple functions that if you are recording, for example, a live stage show and there's a, a kid standing in the center of the stage in the spotlight, generally the rest of the stage will be dark. And if that's the case, the camera might overexpose the lead character because it's trying to compensate for the big dark area that the rest of the stage is. Whereas if you put on the spotlight button, it'll stop the iris down, it'll lower the exposure, and it'll probably make it closer to where that kid who's in the spotlight is exposed properly. And backlight is the same thing in reverse. If you're shooting somebody who's lit by a strong backlight, maybe somebody standing under a tree in the shade and there's a bright background behind them, if you use the backlight compensation user button, then that will open up the iris to compensate for the underexposure that would otherwise have happened. If you assign black fade to a user button and hold that user button down, the image fades to black. If you already have it, currently black and then you let go of that user button, it'll fade up from black back into full exposure. And white fade is the same thing, it just does it to or from white. Then there's digital zoom. My recommendation, don't use digital zoom. <laughs> it's Digital zoom really lowers the resolution of the image. Uh, two times isn't all that bad, but when you get to five times and 10 times, it's gonna be a pretty low resolution image. But hey, if you need that, if you're doing it for an effect or, or you're seeing some UFOs and buy gum, you wanna zoom in as far as possible and, and get what you can, the digital zoom is there. The histogram is a exposure tool that a lot of people like. I mean, the waveform monitor and the zebras, those are great video-centric tools and I encourage you to learn how to use those. 
but some people are intimidated by that. Some people don't necessarily really understand how those work, but they are comfortable with a histogram. Maybe they would just prefer to use a histogram. Well, if that's what you want, you can get it. You can turn it on in the menus or you can assign it to a user button. And the reason I'm mentioning it here is because if you don't really necessarily want to use the waveform monitor, you don't know how it works, you're not gonna take the time to learn how to use it, you could reassign the pre-programmed WFM button to be histogram instead. And so the same workflow, you reach for your exposure tool, but you've preferred a histogram instead of a waveform, you can reprogram that button and that's the way you can get at the histogram instead. If you've just shot a clip, and you know for a fact you are never, ever going to use this clip. It's terrible performance or, uh, you know, there was a buzz in the audio or, or uh, the boom mic was in the shot the whole time and you didn't notice it until too late. You just know that you, you don't want anyone to ever see this clip. You can just assign last scene delete to a user button, press that button, and it doesn't immediately delete it. It brings up a menu to confirm, you know, do you really want to delete this last clip? So it's, it's not really dangerous, but I love having that. Uh, I love getting rid of clips I'm never going to use so that when I get to the editing room, I'm not overwhelmed with dozens and dozens of clips that, that just, you know, have to be looked at just to even remember, oh yeah, we're not going to use that one. There's also super gain. You can turn on 30 or 36 decibels of gain and get a tremendously grainy picture. <laughs> tremendously grainy. But if you're in an absolute low light situation and you need to get an image no matter what and you have no other alternative, super gain might be a way to get the image you're looking for. Or at least it'll get you an image. Capture's another one that just lets you take a still frame or a JPEG and you can do that live while the camera is just pointing at something, or you can do it during recording, or you can even do it in playback. In playback, it'll extract the current still frame of whatever was playing at the time that you pressed the button. So you can pull a still frame out of, out of your recorded video or out of your live video. Another one is freeze frame. That lets you freeze the image on the screen Meanwhile, the audio continues recording, so it's kind of a special effect kind of a thing, and a lot of functions become disabled when you do that. I think this is probably something better left for post, you know, you could just do a post effect, but if you need to or want to freeze the image while letting the audio continue to roll, then freeze frame is a way you can get that. Next up are three functions that are very interesting really neat user buttons, but I'm not really going to talk about them here because we thought they were so interesting. We made separate videos for all of them. So one is for the area focus and exposure mode. One is for focus transition and another one is for the infrared recording mode. So be sure to check out the other videos in this series to find out how to use those user button features. Assign this to a user button and press that button and you'll see that the, a peaking effect is applied to the entire LCD or to the viewfinder. It's not in color like the expanded focus is, you know, the regular focus assist function, but it does make everything on the LCD and on the EVF sharper. Another function to consider is background. Now, this is for when you're using background recording. And background recording is when you're using both memory card slots to record an event, and it records the exact same thing to both slots. But the difference is, with background recording, when you start and stop the camera, only one of the card slots will start and stop. The other one is continuously, constantly recording. Well, this background function that you can assign to a user button is how you start and stop that second card. So you can stop that second card in background recording, you just have to assign it to the user button background, and that way you can start and stop the second card there, and you start and stop the first card with the record buttons on the camera. What if you want the fastest zoom possible and you don't care if it makes a little bit of noise? You can turn on the fast zoom through the user button here, and then when you zoom the camera, it'll go a little bit faster. Instead of taking about five seconds to complete its full range of travel, it'll take about four seconds. So it's about 20, 25% faster, but you'll hear the camera, you'll hear the motors groan a little bit. So you can pick and choose what you want, the absolute fastest zoom with a little bit more noise, or the quietest zoom with a little bit slower. But the fast zoom is the way you make that selection. If you press the auto rec button, it will send that recording flag out the SDI port or out the HDMI port to the external recorder. 
So auto rec becomes a way that you can record when you're not simultaneously recording internally, but it's a way to send a record flag to an external recorder. The camera can focus down to about three feet at its closest point, but if you press the focus macro button, then you can focus all the way down right up to the front of the lens hood. When you're recording in the VLOG L logarithmic gamma curve, then you have the ability to program and use log view assist on one of your user buttons. When you press that user button, it will overlay basically a Rec 709 style gamma on top of your video image so that you can see what it would look like if you graded your image to be basically Rec 709. It's a way to turn that flat, muted VLOG L looking image into something that maybe the client would look at and say, oh, eh, that looks much better. I'm more relieved now. You know, some of the client sees a log image, they might be like, hey, what are you shooting here? Whereas if you show them the rich, fully color saturated log view assist version, then they'll go, ah, yes, excellent, thanks. So it's a way that you can check the exposure and make sure that it will look proper after it's been properly graded. If you want more information on what all these do, you can read the manual, but you can also download the DVX200 book. Panasonic makes available as a free download to you. Definitely get your copy and it explains what all the functions do in detail. Thanks for watching. Hope you found this helpful and be sure to check out the other videos in this series for even more tips and tricks on how to use your DVX200. Panasonic.